Britain represented something that was unknown, barbaric. It was a place of myth and speculation and mystery. Here and there, you see the remnants of stone foundations. It suggests something significant was built here. This site is located amongst a sort of network of streams and waterways. It could have sustained quite a lot of people living there. But any trace of those who walk these stone pathways has long since vanished. Whoever built this put a lot of engineering, ingenuity, and craftsmanship into building this. That You have a commanding view of the whole region, which suggests that it had military importance. We're less than a mile from a major defensive structure. The vast wall was designed to protect those in the south from the people to the north. But the question this poses is, who were these people to the north of the wall? Evidence suggests that beyond this wall lived a feared, painted people. This is really venturing into the dark and mysterious. And you could imagine that it would have been both exciting, but also quite scary. Further excavation reveals oppression and treachery were at play here. Skulls have been found at this site, but they're not to do with burials. It's believed these were taken as trophies. These foundations are just the surface. Underneath is an epic and bloody history. What links the monumental wall that cuts through the wilds of northern England to this eerie, abandoned place? This ancient site is known as Vindolanda. Archaeologist Andrew Burley has spent his life figuring out what went on here, like his father and grandfather before him. It's given up a huge number of its secrets. And those secrets have changed our perceptions. The more and more work we do, the more we start to understand about what happened here almost 2,000 years ago. Relics of walls, broken steps, and remnants of strange foundations provide the barest outline of what once stood here. This building here has got about 20 rooms on the ground floor. Really, really impressive. Digging deep between these desolate ruins, Andrew's father unearthed an incredible clue as to who lived here. We found the remains of a bonfire site. And included on that bonfire was something like 320 or 30 letters, documents. On a windy outcrop in northern England, the ancient ruins of Vindolanda are giving up tantalizing secrets from the past. The biggest indication as to who built this site lies not within it, but scattered all around. Nearby, you've got this long, straight road running from east to west, and that might give us an indication as to who built this and why. Back then, the only people to build roads like this were the Romans. I'm standing here on one of the major Roman roads, and on either side of me, solid walls of stone, solid pavement of stone, and a very big door at the far end. The location of Vindolanda indicates a military purpose. Vindolanda sits on the border between England and Scotland, at the northern edge of the Roman Empire, which once spread from northern Britain to the Middle East. So Vindolanda was a frontier conquest fort. So when the Roman army conquered this part of the landscape, they put a fort down here as part of something called the Roman frontier. So wherever you go inside this fort, you're reminded of structure, rank, status, on the huge impact of Rome. For the Romans, Britain was beyond the known world. It was a land of mystery. It was a land where things were unknown. It was a place where they speculated about myth and mystery. They were especially terrified of the warring barbarians of the north. The Romans called the people north of the wall the painted people, Picti, from where we get the word Picts. They thought they were deeply uncivilized, but respected them as great and fearsome warriors. Evidence of how the Romans tried to control the northern tribes lies within sight of Vindolanda. 
As you sort of rise up and look into the distance, you can see the walls snaking along the landscape, using every sort of nook and cranny of the landscape to help fortify its protection. The vast wall runs across the whole of Northern Britain from coast to coast. This extraordinary 73-mile-long construction is Hadrian's Wall. It was built by one of Rome's most ruthless emperors. Hadrian was a volatile character. It's said that his boyfriend jumped into the river, but many also said that it was Hadrian who pushed him. And when Hadrian came to Britain in 122 AD, he was determined that the northern tribes would not get the better of him. So here we are at Hadrian's Wall, created by 15,000 Roman soldiers in a decade of hard work, sweat, and tears, separating out people on this side, part of the Roman Empire, for the other side, the barbarians to the north. Large parts of it are built using the landscape as part of the defense. There's a big structure along large parts of the wall called the Wind Sill. So you've not only got Hadrian's Wall to contend with, you've got this cliff of rock. And what a formidable thing to try and get past. The configuration of the site reveals how Hadrian's Wall was designed to subjugate the rebellious Picts. What we're looking at here is the power of the Roman Empire to impose its will on a landscape, on a people. Imagine this twice the height with a walkway, crenellations across the top. And even at nighttime, this would be so visible in the landscape. It would also be a wall of light. The soldiers with their torches would run across the top, giving you this contrast between what's inside the Roman Empire and what's outside. For those people who were looking at it from the north, on seeing this cutting edge Roman military fortification, it must have been the most awe-inspiring sight, unlike anything they'd ever seen. Hadrian's Wall was the most unconquerable defense system in the world at the time. So every mile, you get two towers, which command tremendous views right across as far as the eye can see to the north. 30, 40 miles in some places. Nothing can get under the Roman radar. The Romans built 16 defensive forts along the wall to keep the northern hordes at bay. But the stone ruins at Vindolanda don't fit this story. The sprawling fortress sits a mile away from Hadrian's Wall. The population numbers alone at this site range from two and a half to six or 7,000 people. You had people from what is today Belgium, people from modern Germany, people from Switzerland, even North Africa, living and patrolling this area. Rubble at the site reveals that Vindolanda was actually split into two parts, the fort itself and a bustling Roman town. In their downtime, the soldiers manning Hadrian's Wall retreated to Vindolanda. This was more like a small city. People were there with their, with their wives and their children, and they were involved in farming and hunting and all kinds of activities. So it, it was more like a community than simply a military facility. By the fourth century, the Romans were severely overstretched and no longer had the appetite for faraway wars. Their vast empire declined, and so did Vindolanda. The ancient letters found here were hastily destroyed by the Romans as they retreated. They'd lit the bonfire, the rain had come along and put the bonfire out and made it impossible to burn. And then 2,000 years later, we find the site of that bonfire and all the letters are still sitting there in a heap. And what they talk about is just sensational. Uh, everything from demands for beer to birthday party invitations. They give the color and the detail, the shades of gray to life at Vindolanda. Today, Vindolanda and Hadrian's Wall stand as a reminder of the hubris and ambition of the Roman Empire. We can look at it as an incredible monument to military architecture, the, the will of an empire, but also you can see it as a monument to failure, a monument to the fact that the Roman army never finished the job. They couldn't quite beat everybody in Britain.